Welcome, everyone. Um, it's my true pleasure to introduce to you today John Simskins, who is visiting us from USAID. Uh, John knows uh, Duke very well. He is a JD LLM graduate from 1999. And so um, hopefully he has a lot of time to spend in Durham, because it's certainly changed since 1999 when you've been here. Um, so Mr. Simpson has a very uh, illustrious career after leaving Duke. After doing private practice for a while, he has entered government service. So he was the deputy general counsel at OMB, the Office, Office of Management and Budget in the White House. For those of you who don't know OMB, let me tell you how powerful OMB is. You might think Office of Management and Budget sounds very technical. Every agency in the United States government lives in fear of OMB because OMB tells tells them what they can and cannot do. No agency can get anything out without the approval of OMB. Um, he served as the Deputy General Counsel at OMB before moving to USAID, where he's now the General Counsel. Um, I believe that they have a legal staff of about 112 lawyers? About 120 attorneys. 120 attorneys, so quite a large legal office to manage. Um, USAID obviously does a lot of important work in the developing world and is really the major way how the vast majority of the world's population gets to know the U.S. government. Um, and so an incredibly important role not only in trying to aid development, but also in U.S. foreign policy, right? I mean, this is one of the major ways we try and get our foreign policy done. Um, in addition to his work in the government, um, uh, Mr. Simskin has also uh, acted as a professor. He's been a visiting professor at the University of Victoria in Canada, um, and also been an assistant professor at the University of Col or the Charleston College of Law. Um, so, without any further ado, let me please um, welcome. Join me in welcoming Mr. Simkin to Duke Law School. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brewster. Uh, I am. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking at you, and then I want to spend the rest of the time talking with you. So uh, just so that you have a, a sense of, of how we're going to uh, organize today's talk, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of my background and, and how I got to uh, my current position at, at AID. Uh, I'll give you what is hot off the presses. I, I literally got this email to me this morning as I was coming here, uh, a, a trip report. Uh, from a trip that I took to the Philippines last week, uh, where I was uh, on a trip to uh, Bangkok and uh, Manila and a, a, a small area just about an hour and a half flight south of Manila. So I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, by way of background, uh, like Professor Jones, I am from South Carolina. Uh, I, I grew up just outside of Columbia, South Carolina, and, uh, and um, left to go to Harvard undergrad. And after I, after I graduated from college, I knew that I wanted to go specifically to South Africa, um, not to join the Peace Corps and hope that I got placed somewhere, but that I specifically wanted to go to South Africa because it reminded me so much of the stories that I had heard growing up in South Carolina. And to, to, to think that this system was still in place within my lifetime was pretty incredible. So I wanted to, I wanted to see it. I wanted to be a, a part of any transition that was going on there, any change that was going on there. And I was, I was fortunate uh, during my last year of college, I, I basically made it my project to find a job in South Africa, pre-internet, so lots of late night, very expensive phone calls, uh, letters, correspondence, going to the library and reading hard copies of weak old newspapers from, from Johannesburg and Cape Town. And uh, ultimately, I found uh, a couple of jobs. One is a research assistant at the University of the Witwatersrand, uh, which, which came with a very healthy per diem. I ate ramen while I, had, while I got that per diem. I used the rest of that money to live off of for, for the, the, the rest of the year while I was there and worked as a volunteer teacher at one of the first non-racial what you call multiracial here in the United States, one of the first non-racial high schools in the country. And uh, from there, I, I spent another year uh, teaching at the American International School in Johannesburg. That experience was, was formative and transformative. Uh, I was there from 93 to 95. 
The elections were held in April of 1994. Uh, so to be uh, in the country as South Africa was going through this, this historic change uh, made me want all the more to do that for a living. And when I looked at law schools, uh, this was one of the places that I visited. And I visited a, a class that uh, Professor uh, Herbert Bernstein taught uh, on European Union law. I visited uh, Professor Horowitz's class. And uh, those two professors really uh, made me very confident that this was a place where I could be and, uh, and pursue that particular career. And it's a difficult pr career to pursue because often you're off on the margins when your friends are thinking about working in law firms and, and doing other things. And, and that was really what I decided I wanted to do. It's not to say that I did it immediately. <laughs> I went into practice in a, in a small firm in Washington, D.C., what you'd call a boutique law firm, a boutique law firm because it charged a lot of money to give you uh, personalized assistance. And uh, one of the partners in that firm uh, was a, a, a woman who isn't much older than I am named Javette Washington. Uh, she interviewed me for uh, that, that job when I was here as a student and along with uh, another Duke alum. I went to that firm, uh, had a great practice experience, learned uh, really how to practice as a lawyer because I was given a lot of experience and a lot of responsibility very early, and, uh, and then moved from there back to South Carolina to teach, uh, first at Furman University, uh, where I also ran a, a, a public policy institute that's named for Richard Riley, who's a former Secretary of Education, and uh, then to, to Charleston at what was then the, the second year of the Charleston School of Law, uh, which is a whole sordid story that we, can, we could get into about how for-profit law schools operate and what they do, um, if any of you are interested in going into legal academia. And, uh, and then from there, uh, out to the West Coast, uh, to the University of Victoria, uh, and then back in the government, uh, working for the general counsel at OMB, a woman named Javette Washington. So, <laughs> Note to self, be nice to people <laughs> because you never know when you'll, when you'll encounter them again. And I was looking for work in Washington. Javette called me one day and we had remained in touch and she said, I, I just got this job at OMB as general counsel. Would you like to be my deputy? And my first question was, well, what will we do? And she said, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. So the, the, the work of, of the general counsel's office at, at OMB is, uh, is, is highly varied. Uh, I found that uh, over the two years that, that uh, I was there, we got on a daily basis the biggest, hairiest problems that each of the agencies across government was grappling with. Uh, and sometimes uh, interagency problems would, would also land in our laps. When the government shut down, uh, that process of managing the shutdown was coordinated by the general counsel at OMB. So we had daily calls with each of the agencies to let them know what they could and could not do in the absence of funding. Uh, as Professor Brewster said, OMB sounds like, it, it, it sounds innocuous, and I think that's by design so that no one pays attention to it. It's just the Office of Management and Budget, but those are the critical levers of government, that government and, and agencies manage, and they manage to a budget, and the budget reflects the priorities of the president. Uh, so as a result, we were closely aligned with the work that the president was trying to accomplish, or when there were difficulties, we would get called in to, uh, to assist in that effort. Uh, when security clearance reform uh, proved to be uh, something that we needed to pursue after the Navy Yard shootings in 2013, uh, we were asked to stand up a, a group to conduct that reform and, and, and deliver recommendations to the president. When the cyber attacks occurred over the course of a couple of years, uh, beginning with one initial hack of OPM and then a series of hacks thereafter, uh, we coordinated the response along with OPM and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so I learned a lot about cybersecurity in the process. Uh, when healthcare.gov didn't work so well, uh, we made sure that we could hire talent from Silicon Valley to come in, uh, uh, first conduct some triage and analyze what the issues were and get that up and running. And then as a result, a follow-on to create something called U.S. Digital Service, which is now like the 
the, the Digital Marine Corps uh, for the U.S. government, and it's, it's a way in which we attract talent from Silicon Valley, usually on a limited basis because they make a little bit more money in, private, in the private sector than they do to, to come in and work for government, but they are interested in serving their country, and we give them, we give them an opportunity to do that. Uh, so coming from that experience and, and coming from an experience at, at OMB where on a, on a regular basis we would be trying to get agencies to come together to, to resolve issues, uh, whether it was around policy or regulation, uh, it, it made the next job uh, at USAID all the more attractive because what I could offer stepping into that role was uh, someone who had uh, experience across government and who could uh, help to resolve issues as they uh, as they developed across government. It's also nice because in my current job, we're one agency. We only have a few big hairy problems every day. I don't have to deal with a big hairy problem and it gives me a chance to think more broadly both about the vision for the office and the agency and the management on a daily on a day-to-day -day basis of what's essentially a 120 lawyer law firm uh, and and the entire experience has been uh, has been fascinating and and one of the best uh, professional opportunities I've ever had when I first got the job I was really excited because as a JDLLM it's probably the job that I was actually prepared for. Uh, and I was also a little sad because I'm a presidential appointee and that means that essentially I turn into a pumpkin on January 20th of 2017. Uh, so I, I, I won't have a lot of time in the seat, uh, but I am I'm attempting to, to make the most of that time. And, and what I'll show you in a minute is, is an example of, of, of some of those uh, activities that I'm involved in to, to try to do that. Um, in addition, just a little bit of background uh, on USAID for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Sometimes when I tell people uh, that I meet out in, in public, you know, if they ask me what I do and I say I work for USAID, they don't know if it's, it's a public institution or a private institution or what they do. So just as uh, by way of overview, we are the world's largest bilateral donor. Um, meaning government to government, not multilateral like the World Bank or something like that. Uh, we, we have an annual appropriation of about 24 to $28 billion, and uh, we work in over 100 countries. We have a, a series of, of projects that have long tail effect. Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, for probably obvious reasons, are our areas of greatest concentration now. Uh, that won't always be the case. Prior to Afghanistan and Pakistan, it was Egypt and Israel. Uh, so wherever conflict is, is most acute is typically where we are most heavily involved. But then we have a, a, a series of projects in Africa that uh, make up about an $80 billion portfolio over the life of those programs. And the programs range from uh, water and sanitation uh, and, and hygiene programs to uh, to maternal and child health programs, to education, to finance, uh, to, uh, to programs that promote uh, trade, industry, and technology. Uh, one example of the, of, the, of the trade, industry, and technology programs is something called Power Africa. And uh, the way in which we engage on, on the trade front is to basically create the infrastructure for increased trading activity. Power Africa is, uh, is a project in which by 2030, we will uh, create an additional uh, 30,000 megawatts of power that will, uh, that will produce another 60 million connections uh, across the continent. So that's you know, essentially almost two Californias, basically. And the, the transformative uh, prospects for this are incredible because that's our investment as the U.S. government. Uh, their their follow-on investments, uh, our $7 billion has been leveraged to $43 billion of investment in uh, electrical infrastructure across the continent. And, and the opportunities that are there are tremendous because Africa loses, as a continent, about 2.1% uh, of GDP just through blackouts, uh, power shortages, you know, uh, load, load shedding, and, and things like that that, that are 
just a result of its electrical infrastructure. And we're, we're looking at, at uh, delivering that, elec that, that electricity in a number of different ways through wind, solar, water, um, in, in ways that we think are, are going to be uh, economically viable and, and ecologically viable. So through Power Africa, you can imagine what the effect is going to be if there is uh, sustained access to reliable, cheap energy. Uh, across the continent, a continent that already has, if any of you have spent time uh, in Africa, you'll know that there are a number of countries that already have a culture of entrepreneurialism. And that, that culture can be, uh, can be encouraged and, and promoted through uh, a, 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 a much more stable infrastructure. So it's not just building roads and, and other things, but also creating the, the, the basic building blocks for uh, for trade to occur, but also for people to have much more uh, uh, satisfying, rich, productive lives. Schools can open, schools can stay open, hospitals can be opened in places where they wouldn't have been able to, to operate uh, before. And, and all of that is, is critical to the work that we do. Um, my job as, as general counsel is basically to take a, a group of talented lawyers uh, and give them the tools that they need, and then get out of their way. Uh, because they know uh, better than I do the subject matter that, that, uh, that they practice. I practice law very little on a daily basis. It would probably be a bad idea to get me to practice law right now. I could probably write something here and there. But I, I, don't, I don't practice uh, as much as I engage in uh, policy discussions. I advise our administrator. Uh, who's a woman named Gail Smith. Uh, she was recently confirmed about a month ago, so she's uh, new in the position. And uh, I also engage with our missions abroad. About half of our 120 lawyers are in Washington, D.C. They serve USAID's uh, various bureaus, which are broken up by region and also by function. So we have a Global Health Bureau, for example, but we also have an Africa Bureau. Uh, and. The Global Health Bureau works on all things that are health-related Africa, obviously all things that are Africa-related. Sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. Uh, we have uh, 60 attorneys, as I said, serving those clients in Washington, D.C. And then in the field, we have an additional 60 attorneys, roughly. Um, most in, in single postings in USAID missions. And in those missions, they are basically like solo practitioners with a huge back office. So you as a, as a young lawyer at, at USAID might be sent to, I don't know, Morocco. And you'll be the only lawyer at post. State Department doesn't, if you work at L, you work in Washington, D.C. for the most part. You don't work out in the world. Uh, but if you work at, at USAID, uh, there's a strong chance that you'll end up working uh, around the world as a Foreign Service officer. Uh, but those Foreign Service officers have the support of everyone back in the office. And as to culture, and I think this is important, uh, our lawyers support each other. If someone has a question, uh, they can put that question out to the entire group. And I've been, I've been shy. Yeah, I, I come from the White House where people aren't, well, they're not nice. <laughs> That's probably the best way to say it. Not all nice. You know, some are nice, but they're not all nice. And a lot of people lack certain social skills, and it's, it's very difficult. But uh, at USAID, because, partly because of the mission, I think people are, are, are much more interested in, in not only helping others broadly, but helping each other on their team. Uh, so when lawyers put those questions out there, they get lots of good feedback. Not, why are you asking this, or this is a stupid question, or, well, you know, some subtle way to make it seem as if they should actually know what the answer is when they don't know. Uh, our lawyers work together. And to see them all in the same place, we had a, a, a global uh, resident legal office, officer uh, conference in Washington, D.C. in October. And that was my first interaction with a lot of, of the lawyers on my team. To see them come together, it's, it is so un-attorney-like. When they meet each other, they hug, and, and, and they, they love each other's company. Yes, they argue, but you know, the arguments, in, they end in a good place. And it, in some ways, it actually reminds me of uh, the law school experience that I had here, which was, I think, much 
different from that of some of my, my, my peers when I tell them, you know, I actually kind of like law school. I, I enjoyed my professors and they were, they were accessible. They actually hung out with us when we, when we were having social events. Uh, it made it less like a burden. And what we try to do in our office is to make it fun and to make it like a family. We really do support each other. And that's um, also vital to helping us carry out our mission. So before we open this up and have more of a dialogue, instead of me up here droning on, um, I'd also like to show you uh, a little bit of, of what I do when I leave and go on on these trips, these TDYs, to, to other countries. This is from my, my trip to the Philippines last week, and uh, you'll, you'll get a, a flavor of, of some of the things that, that I am involved in. That's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is a meeting with uh, the, the, the governor of the province uh, just outside of Manila, uh, where uh, I went to, to visit one of our project sites. It was the first time I've, I've been given a a key to anything. Uh, so I got a key to the province, I got a key to the city, and I don't know what that opens, but I have them, <laughs> nevertheless. This, uh, hang on a second. Um, the individual who's standing to my left is our resident legal officer in the Philippines. Uh, his name's Randy Ali. Uh, Randy is a foreign service officer, uh, just like anyone who works for the State Department. Our lawyers who work abroad are foreign service officers. Some of our lawyers back in D.C. are also foreign service officers. Others are civil servants. So they, they work on the, the GS scale in, in government speak, meaning that they don't travel. They're, they're based in D.C. Uh, and the foreign service officers as a career are intended to rotate to different locations. And Randy is, is one of our uh, foreign service officers who works as the resident legal officer in the Philippines. Uh, that means that he is not only there to give legal advice, but he participates in the management of the mission. Uh, each of our missions abroad is, is managed by someone uh, called a mission director. And that mission director often considers the lawyer to be an integral part of his or her management team, and he certainly is. Uh, so here is a, is a speech at a stakeholders forum. Uh, this stakeholders forum is part of what we call our, our city's development initiative. And uh, it is a, a, a comprehensive approach to development in which we look at what we call second tier cities in the, in the Philippines and try to assist them in economic development. In the, the case of, of Bohol and, and Tagbilaran, which is uh, where this, this stakeholders forum is, is occurring, we're building uh, capacity in their tourism industry. Uh, so th the, the Japanese are building a big airport there that will be able to accommodate large uh, airplanes coming from the American West Coast and throughout Asia. Uh, we are building roads. We're also helping to uh, build their, their, their hotel infrastructure and tourism facilities. And we're creating markets for uh, their agricultural sector. So it's not just creating service industry jobs. It's also going back to the growers and giving them markets that wouldn't have existed before in, in the tourism industry. And, and that's what this uh, CDI the city's development initiative was all about. And here we're signing the ceremonial agreement uh, and lots of pomp and ceremony and circumstance. Uh, this was probably my favorite part of the trip, which was a visit to an elementary school. Uh, as, as I was here, it occurred to me that I am a fourth generation teacher. Um, and I've, I've taught at just about every level you could teach. Um, and. Uh, I had a chance to, to spend time at this elementary school. We delivered a set of materials, both uh, reading materials for the kids and, uh, and supplies for the teachers. And they, they liked to high five and they had you know, lots of Philippine and, and American flags greeting me when I got there. And the highlight of, of that visit was reading to a second grade class. Uh, and and they, were, they were completely into it. We had a great time. And, uh, and then they, they, they gave me some, some cards as, as thank yous on my way out. Uh, but this is part of a project that we have. So you know everything that I do really sort of sits on top of the work of, of a bunch of people. And uh, this is a project in which we're, we're supporting something called Read Philippines. And it's, 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 uh, it's, it's supporting literacy at, at the elementary school level uh, through a number of, of, uh, of, of products that we provide, reading instruction for teachers 
and just the basic building blocks for, for uh, raising the, the literacy rate in, in the country. And uh, <clears throat> the last of, of my uh, uh, events that's captured here is, uh, is a meeting that we had with uh, something called Ecofish, which is looking to promote uh, uh, maritime uh, development and conservation. And uh, we, we met with this, this uh, fisheries group that, uh, that described to us the work that they're doing, work that we uh, support uh, through partnerships, and uh, involves this, this combination of, of marine scientists, uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, and we hope, ultimately, uh, consumers and, and, and restaurants. And, and one of the, the ideas that, that emerged out of this, this meeting was to take something like the Sustainable Seafood Initiative, which grew out of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and, and uh, create something like that in the Philippines, which is developing uh, uh, an increasingly vibrant food culture, um, not just in the Philippines, but also elsewhere. Here in the United States, Filipino food is like, that's the hot thing right now. If you go to New York, if you go to Washington, Philippine uh, restaurants are, are becoming very popular. Um, so that's uh, the work that I do. I'll just leave that up so that we can have some light there. Um, and uh, that gives you a, a little, uh, flavor of really the work that the agency does, because as I said, it's that that that's the result of the work of our lawyers, uh, of people who are local hires. We call foreign service nationals. Uh, they are substantive experts uh, at USAID, and they provide a lot of technical expertise. But they also help us to build relationships. That first slide, going back to Tagbilara, uh, that partnership, that stakeholder summit, wouldn't have come together if if our Foreign Service nationals had not built relationships at the local and provincial level uh, and, and knit together these, these webs of trust that allow people to work over long periods of time, not just on specific projects. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, the kind of work that we do, that's uh, the kind of work that USAID is involved in. I have been a law professor in the past, so I will drone on and on and on if you don't have questions, but I'm going to stop now. And, 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 and open the floor up to questions, and uh, we can go from there. Yes? Uh, so the, you talk about primary education in the Philippines. Uh, so the law fund uh, advocates for education beyond primary school. Is that a priority of USA? And then, too, if you don't talk about the Global Development Act in the USA, I think it's fairly new. Sure. What it does. Sure, sure. Um, first question uh, about uh, priorities beyond primary education. Uh, we certainly have them. We've, we've worked uh, all the way through to, uh, to higher education, um, to, the, to the point of, of even building uh, colleges and universities in, in countries around the world, and, and then getting those uh, up and running. Uh, we feel like the best intervention at the moment is, is in early childhood education, and, and then to follow those students through. Um, and really, even before that, in maternal and child health, uh, what what has really uh, fascinated me about the work that we do is that through our maternal and child health program, we have literally saved lives and created lives that are going to have a much higher quality of life uh, through reduced stunting, um, uh, through increased nutrition. So once those kids then reach learning age, they're equipped to learn. So we want to be there. <laughs> so that we can, we can take them up through that, that early learning process. But I think, as, as your question anticipates, uh, that's never enough. And the, 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 next, the next steps are to, to follow those individuals through, uh, to give them certainly job opportunities, but also to give them citizenship opportunities. I'm not someone who believes that you, you educate people to be workers. I think you educate people to be humans. And uh, what we're focused on is really increasing their opportunity to participate in the, the whole scope of human activity, as opposed to just being, you know, working in someone's factory or someone's plant. Um, to your second question about the Global Development Lab, it is, uh, to my mind, it's, it's like the analog to what I described with the U.S. Digital Service. We have people who don't typically work in government who are attracted to the work that we're doing in the Global Development Lab, who come in um, sometimes on a short-term basis, sometimes on a longer-term basis, to look at new ways of addressing development challenges. And sometimes we do that literally through challenges. We have what we call these grand challenges, where we put a problem out to the world. And we say, solve this with Ebola, 
one of the problems we had with Ebola was that the, the, the suits that people were using to, to, um, to, uh, to work with uh, people who were infected were difficult to put on and put off. They uh, carried with them the risk of infection when you were, when you were in the process of uh, putting them on and, putting the, and taking them off. So we wanted to develop a better suit. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, issued a grand challenge. And uh, one of the members of the team that won that, that challenge is, a, is a, a dressmaker in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, who makes wedding dresses. And she came up with a new Ebola suit. <laughs> that is easy to put on and easy to put off. I don't know what that says about her wedding dresses. Uh, and and that, was, uh, that was an example of, of, an, of an innovation that we wouldn't have come to on our own if we were just uh, thinking about how to solve it through the regular sort of bureaucratic, bring in an expert who, who works on hazardous diseases. We, we needed designers. And one of the things that the development lab does, it, it introduces this design element to the work that we do that has been missing. Uh, so uh, that's, that's part of it. It is likely to survive going forward, but it, it emerged during this administration. It's likely to survive going forward simply because it's proven its worth. And, uh, and it's, it's now been recognized as, uh, as, uh, as, a, as an important part of the work that we do with money. You know, that's, that's the most important form of recognition in, in government, that it's been funded. And, and uh, so we expect it to be around for a while. Thanks. Yes, sir. Do so you want me to take the first two, then? Okay. Uh, first, it, it, you, you do need to be qualified as a U.S. attorney uh, to work uh, for U.S. aid as an attorney. Um, I'll, I'll say that, but I'll also say that there are other ways in which you can work for or with U.S. aid other than being a U.S. qualified attorney. Some of our partners, often in the private sector, uh, groups like Chemonix and, and DAI, RTI here in the, in the research triangle, uh, they will hire uh, foreign nationals as part of their technical team of technical experts. And you, know, you need not be qualified in the U.S. to, to serve in that capacity. And we, we work with a number of foreign uh, trained lawyers um, who uh, are, are vital parts of, of the work that we do. And so that's, that's the short answer. Uh, you, can, you can work elsewhere much more easily as a foreign trained lawyer than in D.C. for USAID. Um, my own personal opinion is that it's much more interesting and exciting to work outside of D.C. than in D.C. and you can always come back to D.C. or, or get to D.C. at some point if that's really where you want to be. Uh, so that's a possibility. Now as to the second question, we work with a combination of the two. Uh, we also have a, a huge democracy and governance uh, presence, it's not as well funded anymore. Uh, but if you ask a lot of people in, in aid what kind of work would they want to do, as someone who used to work on constitutional reform and constitutional design, uh, I can understand they would, they would say the same thing, that they would like to work on democracy and governance. As a result, we end up doing things that have democracy and governance components that may not be squarely in the DG field. So if we're working on education, then we want to make sure that money that we're giving to the Ministry of Education isn't being siphoned off. Um, and if we, if we are concerned about bad faith actors uh, among our governmental partners, then we'll limit the, the government to government assistance that we give. And, and we'll go around them until we get kicked out or, or until we find others who are, who are better partners uh, in that sense. But we, we spend a lot of time thinking about that is, is, the, is the short answer to that question. And we want to make sure that um, not only are we engaging in 
interventions in those countries that are having impact, but that we're building true partnerships. I think if you look at the future of the work that we do, uh, as we move into more transactional work, more financial work, um, to graduate from aid, which is possible if you become a member of the organization um, of, of OECD, then, then you essentially aren't qualified for assistance from USAID anymore. I don't think that should be the end of our engagement, though. What I would like to see and what others would like to see is a partnership that involves building uh, financial markets, that involves uh, creating greater access to capital so that people who are within those countries and are looking to create better lives for themselves have that access without having to go through governmental structures to do so. And, and that becomes even more of a partnership of equals as opposed to us giving you something uh, in, in a much more paternalistic uh, relationship. But um, it's certainly true of most of the people who work at aid that they're, they're very cognizant and very sensitive to the, the dynamics of, of how those interactions occur. And they, I think they, we go to great pains to ensure that uh, we are enculturated into the places where we work. And that's one of the reasons why we have foreign service nationals working for us. What most people don't realize is that of the 8,000 people who work for aid, most of them are foreign service nationals. Um, they're not Americans. They're not direct hires. Um, and, and those foreign service nationals, as I said, are subject matter experts. They're not drivers. They're not admin assistants. They are the people who, who run the programs that we have in country. We often lose them because they're good. <laughs> they'll go into government. They'll go into business. Uh, but they're the backbone of the work that we do. I have a follow-up question on the first question. Mm -hmm. That I mean, your presentation on USAID was so compelling that I think a lot of people in the room might be wondering two questions, which is, First, what are you looking for in your attorneys, right? I mean, are you looking for people straight out of law school? Are you looking for a certain level of experience in either government or private practice? And then second, where do alumni of USAID go? I can imagine that a lot of them want to make it a 100% never leave career, but I imagine you also have some turnover. And kind of, you know, where do people who have USAID experience as attorneys then move on to? Uh we tend to hire, in, in the Office of General Counsel, we tend to hire uh, attorneys with some experience, uh, sort of mid to senior level associates. Uh, if you want to work in a law firm, go work in a law firm. Let them train you and then come work for us and have fun uh, and, and live all over the world and, and do interesting work and then ultimately move into management at USAID. And you don't even have to practice law anymore if that's what you don't want to do. Uh, so when, when we bring people in, we typically bring folks in who, who've had some law firm experience or worked in other government agencies. Uh, just so you know, of, of the 60 attorneys in Washington, uh, three others uh, besides me are Duke Law graduates, um, including the person who runs our intern at an externship program. Just remember that. Uh, and. Um, and, and so we're, we're very much interested in getting people from here, but we're also interested more, more broadly in getting uh, people who have some, some practice experience, who, who come with some skills and training. Uh, your use of the term alumni is, is appropriate because we refer to people who used to work at, at USAID as our alumni. We have an alumni association that is incredibly active, uh, people who work for USAID really never leave in, in, in some ways. When, when we had that, that lawyers conference I was telling you about in October, there were a lot of people who came back who used to work in the general counsel's office, some who, who now work in other parts of USAID, others who have nothing to do with USAID anymore, including my predecessor in this job, who just keeps coming back. I think he thinks he made, it, he made the bad decision, but uh, he can't get a do-over. and. Um, we, we uh, have a, 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 a great degree of, of, of connectivity uh, among folks who used to work in the agency. Some go into the private sector and work for development, private development corporations that are typically partners with USAID. Uh, others, uh, and particularly our lawyers actually, others will occasionally work for the agency um, on a, on a one-off basis for a few months here and there, they'll, they'll, they'll be brought in as um, 
uh, personal services contractors. So there are a number of different hiring mechanisms that we have at USAID. You're not just hired as a direct hire. You are now an attorney, uh, employee, until you decide you're not an employee. Uh, we have uh, limited term contracts that we can bring people in under. We have all sorts of mechanisms that we can use to creatively uh, enhance our workforce. And one of those is to, to take uh, people who are retired, or maybe want to reduce workload and and deploy them when we have lawyers who are going on home leave so they step in to replace them they know the drill they know how the job operates and uh, they're an incredible resource because they've, they've done the job for so long that uh, they provide this wealth of experience so we'd like to keep them around and I actually as as a, as a newcomer in, in this role I consult with with that group on a regular basis just to get the, the benefit of their experience. So another question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Very good questions. Uh, first, uh, the, the, the role of the lawyer is, is critical. Um, and it's, all, it's also determined by what the client wants. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the great benefit of working with clients who want lawyers involved early. You know, as, as a government attorney, uh, one of the, the things that you're always stressing is get the lawyers involved early, get the lawyers involved early. Like, don't come to us when, when it's, it's, it's an unmanageable problem. Let us help you in the beginning. Sometimes we might say, well, you know, this really isn't something that we need to be uh, opining on, so, you know, but, but we'll just, just keep us informed, keep us in the loop. Uh, other times we might be able to intervene and, and steer you clear of, of some potential pitfalls. Uh, so uh, that's always a, a concern when you're working in government. And, and in this particular agency, with this particular leadership, uh, that's not a problem at all. When Gail Smith came in as administrator, you know, I met with her on her first day. Uh, she said, I want to keep my lawyers close. And uh, she calls on me for advice. It's not necessarily legal advice. You know, the, the, the value that you add is not simply to, to draft agreements and, uh, and opine on the law. The value that you add is also judgment and, uh, and clarity in communicating that judgment. And those are skills that are, you will see when you get back out in the world or out in the, into the world, are in short supply. And, and lawyers are um, a great resource to draw upon, not simply for your legal expertise. And the, the things that our lawyers do vary uh, based on um, you know, our contracting, procurement activities, uh, our legislation, oversight uh, matters ethics and administrative law, um, the, the, the folks who do support the Global Development Lab and, and, and come up with new ways to, uh, to, to give them room to operate, but also to protect the intellectual property that's generated in the course of those activities. Um, you know, program design itself. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a range of, of activities. And, and in our office, we divide those uh, activities up among practice groups. So we have uh, a dozen practice groups uh, among our 60 lawyers. Yes, in the back, and then we'll come back around. Um, I, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. Certainly. Um, I'm actually from Palestine, and I grew up seeing the work of USA in our school, judicial sector, and so And I actually have two questions. The first one is, <coughs> What are the main challenges that faces the USAID agency in conflict area situations? And the second one, I always ask myself about the logo from the American people and what does this mean and why? So the, the logo issue is, is, uh, is an interesting question because we, we spend a lot of time on branding, a lot of time, and we actually have uh, statutory requirements, branding requirements. Whenever we provide aid, it has to have the USAID logo and from the American people. It can't have a flag. It, it can't say, you know, uh, Department of Agriculture. It has to say USAID from the American people, unless we get an exception. And there are ways, in, there, there are situations in which if, if that's 
problematic, if it's going to draw attention where we don't want to draw attention, then, then you don't. So uh, from the American people is the first D in development, diplomacy, and defense. And, and, and those are the, 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 the three uh, legs on which our foreign, foreign affairs stool sits. Uh, development, diplomacy, and defense. So, you know, essentially we, we, we want to be the nice guys. And we want to be uh, the ones who make the other two unnecessary. And we feel like if we can, if we can develop relationships, people-to-people -people relationships, um, then we stand a good chance of uh, developing much broader relationships, country-to-country -country relationships through those. Uh, the work that we're doing now in, in Colombia and, and Peru, I was there in, in December, is uh, assisting people who are involved in conflict situations return to their communities and engage in meaningful and productive activities. Uh, so uh, that's really important as a part of that, you know, from the American people uh, belief. And then um, the, the challenges uh, to working in those situations, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to be in Ramallah in eight, eight days or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to it. It will be my first visit to the Middle East, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's a place of great interest to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about being there. Uh, not as much in Ramallah as, as in other places. Uh, our, our, our greatest challenge is just being able to move and operate. Um, when our lawyers go to Kabul, and when they're stationed in Kabul, when they fly into the airport, they then get picked up by a helicopter and they get coptered into the U.S. compound because you can't ride on, on the streets. It's too dangerous. Um, and they have been taking incoming lately. Um, it's, it's a, it is a, 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 a dangerous, stressful, hazardous environment. Uh, so that is the, that's, the, that's the most immediate challenge. Um, secondary challenges, but also very important challenges, are just ensuring that our money is going to the right people and the right places. Uh, we have uh, now developed a system to, uh, to evaluate our foreign partners to ensure that none of the key uh, office holders, none of the key members of, of our partners um, are engaged in terrorist activities. So we cannot be financing terrorists. We cannot be engaged with organizations that are um, terrorist organizations. So we, we're very careful about that. And that's, that's another of, of the challenges. Uh, and, and uh, you know, when, when you're in a, in, a, in a poor or deteriorating security environment, then you can't even see the work that you're doing. We have, we have programs in, in Afghanistan right now that we can't see. So I can't tell you if, if, they're, if they're having the intended effect or not, because we can't get people out there to look at them. And until that changes, and um, we'll suspend our activities, or we'll we'll hold back and 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 and, and rely on others to report back to us, uh, but it makes it very difficult to operate. Yes. 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 I have a question. Obviously, you're first of all, thank you for being here and speaking with us. But you're a political appointee, but most of us, if we go into USA, would not be a political appointees. So we wouldn't be under a specific administration. Do you think that the culture? Um, in USA differs significantly based on the policy objectives of the administration. For instance, I know during the Bush years in India, getting India to pass an anti-constitution law and also dealing with HIV in India, uh, significantly, USA had a significant role mm -hmm. in that, um, which I imagine under the Obama administration, nothing like that. No, we're still against prostitution. Yeah. Because yeah. 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 that yeah. seems like a lot of people in India, a lot of the organizations on the ground, because of that war on prostitutes themselves mm -hmm. rather than a war on prostitution. Right. So I get, well, my question is not really about that, but about if the, the culture is different between, based on the administration. Yeah. And, and abortion is another example. And the Helms Amendment, which, which, which speaks to funding activities that are related to abortion. Um, we carry out a number of presidential initiatives at USAID, but those initiatives tend to be much bigger than um, political considerations. I think one of the one of the good things about working as a career uh, attorney at, at USAID is that you're not as 
subject to the vagaries of the political winds, as you might be in another agency. You know, if you're working in the Department of Justice, then it's, it's a very different environment uh, from one administration to the next. Uh, what we tend to see at, at aid is um, former administrators actually collaborate, regardless of, of who appointed them, uh, and, and they, they assist each other. Uh, lawyers have very little, maybe they're just telling me this because I'm there and they'll say something else when I leave, but l lawyers have very little um, difficulty moving from one administration to the next who, who are on the career staff. Uh, PEPFAR is an example. So you know, the, 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 the President's uh, uh, AIDS Reduction Initiative, in working with HIV AIDS, uh, which came from, from President Bush, uh, is something that we've actually built upon in the Obama administration. Uh, often those presidential initiatives don't just get thrown out when someone else comes in, if we can demonstrate they have impact. And you can bet that the career people who have been working on those things and who know them best will be able to tell you if they have impact or not. Uh, so that, that, that diminishes the, 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 the possibility of there being wide swings. Um, the other part that plays a role in, in focusing on, on the work that we do is uh, earmarks. Uh, earmarks typically aren't uh, uh, an issue in, in domestic uh, appropriations anymore, uh, but they are very much a part of foreign assistance. So some of the programs that we engage in are the result of some member of, of some committee deciding that someone uh, needs assistance somewhere and they need to get money to do that. And we're compelled uh, to engage in those act activities. Uh, so that sometimes leads us to uh, a little bit of mission drift and lack of focus, uh, much more so than the presidential initiatives, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh, how many do you interact with US, private U.S. companies who invest in foreign uh, states? A lot and increasingly so. Um, do you, uh, just yeah, go ahead. Uh, how much level of regulation do you actually do for foreign we have We have limited to no regulatory uh, involvement with, with private companies that, that we work with. I mean, we have, we have regulations that we issue, we have rules that we issue, uh, but, but in the main, they, do, they don't really speak to that activity. They're, they're regulated through other means, but, but not by us, and not through us. Um, I think increasingly we will be uh, engaging in public-private partnerships of various kinds. Uh, the, the work in Power Africa is an example of, of us engaging with the private sector to uh, be a force multiplier so that it's not just us uh, as USAID giving money. Um, we also coordinate with other aid organizations in other countries around the world and we try to complement each other. So if the Japanese are building an airport in, in Tagbilaran, then we want to build the roads to allow people to get to and from uh, the tourist resorts that they'll be visiting once they land at that airport. And it's, it's that uh, that uh, uh, attempt at, at, at harmonizing our efforts that we feel is most efficient. Yes. I just had uh, two brief questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, first, just going off of the Power Africa um, and the, the energy and power plan there, um, is there any sustainable uh, development plan to eventually have, uh, have USA pass that infrastructure on to the governments that are working on? Um, and, and also, sorry, to reduce that. Uh, secondly, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about uh, lawyers um, and how much involvement they have in the program design and implementation of the development program. Uh, to your last question, it, it varies, but it's always encouraged. Um, sometimes it just it depends on the the bureau that's that's carrying out the project or designing the project. Uh, sometimes it depends on the mission that's that's executing the project. Uh, but it's not unusual, and as a result, uh, lawyers who work for us often end up moving into senior management because they get that experience. That's one of the, the reasons why they move into those positions. It's they, that they understand the program cycle and, and how programs work. Um, in almost every circumstance, when we uh, build something uh, in partnership with our local partners, that belongs to them. Uh, and whether it's a university or whether it's a hydroelectric dam, uh, 
any anything that's a result of that of that project or program will will then uh, be the, the the property of of the country in which we've operated. We don't we don't retain any control or ownership over that. Yes. Uh, so the last few years, a lot of politicians have been knocking foreign aid and saying, you know, we need to cut the spending. But, um, arguably, though, with especially with China going around the world and just dropping a lot of cash in developing nations, it's more important than ever. Um, and so I just wanted to ask you if you had encountered this kind of uh, anti-funding mm. um, sentiment and what the best arguments were for the strategic use of foreign aid as mm -hmm. furthering our international goals. Um, I worked on the Hill in 1996, be just before I came here as a student, um, just for a year. And at that time, there was a lot of talk about defunding USAID, getting rid of it, um, zeroing it out. Uh, and after 9-11, much of that talk ended. Uh, so as part of the overall hearts and minds strategy, I think it's it's been, um, you know, folks on a bipartisan basis have realized that it's in our interest to engage in this activity. I think it's, it's, it's activity in which we get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, you know, $24 billion sounds like a lot of money, but it's not. And if you ask people generally, how much money should we be spending on, on foreign aid? Uh, what percentage of the budget? 10%? Oh, no, no, that's too high. Well, then if that's too high, then uh, what's up? What's up? a good amount. Oh, about 5%. Well, we spend less than half of that on foreign aid. And so the people who, who rail against it are usually just uninformed. Uh, their representatives uh, tend to understand a lot better. Our uh, administrator was confirmed in the Senate with 78 votes, um, one of which she got from my home state of South Carolina, which is not common. <laughs> uh, and the other one just abstained. Uh, so there, there was there. Lindsey Graham, Graham didn't vote. Tim Scott voted for her, and uh, you know, uh, Republic. And and I just actually I, I had a conversation with him at the weekend where he was praising the work that we we're doing, and said, "I want to go with you on one of these trips." And I'm like, "Well, you know, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> we're friends, but we're not like friends." Um, but we, 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 have, uh, we have bipartisan support. And as long as we can demonstrate that we're being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, I think we'll be okay. And that's, that's a challenge. But, you know, that's a challenge that we should accept. It's our responsibility. I don't, I don't see that as, as being burdensome at all. That might have to be the last word. Sure. But thank you all very much. And please join me in thanking Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.